Okay. Um, let's just start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on taxes, rules, and regulations for visual artists. Uh, my name is Aslak Hayasten, and I'm the managing director of VISP. If you haven't already, you can sign up as a member for free at visp.no. Um, before I welcome today's designated accountant, some practical information. Um, if you want to ask a question, press the, um, the Q&A button, which is on your bottom um, right. It says Q&A. To ask um, a question, you can decide if you want to um, ask it with your full name or anonymously. It's up to you. Um, and all questions in English, please. If you're watching this webinar on YouTube, this option is unfortunately not possible. Um, and please do ask questions as we go along. Our experience is um, with webinars is that everyone, everybody waits to the very last minute before they uh, ask questions and it kind of, um, and then we run out of time, of course. Um, also, the only two people visible on screen, screen will be me and Christopher. So today you don't have to worry about your appearances. Um, so I will now give the word to Christopher Jadavik Vastal. He's partner and leader of accounting at um, PricewaterhouseCoopers Norway. Um, hello, Christopher. Hi, hi. Certainly... You, sorry, would you also maybe say a bit about your experience with working with, um, with culture and arts as an accountant? Yeah. I was just uh, uh, when you when you talked about appearance, I just realised that the, the portrait photo of the of the registry for this course uh, looks rather dull. So so hopefully I look better on screen than I do on that photo. I'll need to change that. Um, yes, I have been working with PwC now for eight years. Um, prior to that, twelve years with some some company called Vostel and Ericsson, which was um, based basically in arts and culture. Uh, and, and founded by myself back in 1998. So I will be actually working for PwC for now another 23 days. Then, uh, in fact, my uh, career at PwC is, is coming to a close. I will take the next year off uh, and do um, uh, actually work even more in within the arts field. Uh, so that would be a very exciting year for me, but uh, I will just surely put up my contact details should anyone have any questions uh, when they come through the next year. So, and hopefully I'll also be working with this for future uh, courses, etc. So um, yeah, I have been working a long time with this. Uh, this is actually the first time, well, the second time, but the first time within this subject that I will be speaking in English. So you'll have to forgive me when I, uh, Look at Google Translate here, or uh, or I may use some Norwegian words in between. Um, uh, luckily, uh, lo looking at the list, I see that there are uh, non-Norwegian speaking members. So that means that not all of you are great in English. So that that's slight uh, <laughs> slight positive side. Um, what I'll go through today is is uh, several things. Uh, we have received a lot of questions by forehand so so the course that i'm going to to talk to you about today uh, will answer those questions and please uh, put your questions on the q a uh, and also will uh, uh, disturb me during the talk and and then give me the questions during the course and of course the q a session prior to that so basically the three topics can you all see i hope you can all see the agenda on on the screen now and not just the, the picture of me and also but uh, we are going to talk about business types uh, just quickly, and then we'll go into the main uh, area of, of, uh, of uh, taxes and deductions and reporting, and that's what most of the questions that you have asked prior to this have been um, have been uh, relating to. Uh, and then we'll shortly talk about VAT. Uh, there is not a lot to talk about VAT because when you are a visual artist, you are basically exempt from the VAT law, but we'll have some topics on VAT and, of course, accounting in the Q&A session uh, in the end. So, business types. I know a lot of you uh, are running your business as the Norwegian word enkelt person for a talk, which I found the, the explanation of the English version to be sole proprietorships. So, 
uh, and again, I'll have to apologize on behalf of the Norwegian state because I was trying to uh, look for information for this course to put on in English. I realized that what I thought was good translated pages, both on Alten and Skatteetaten and all these places that I know a lot of you go to find information about tax purposes, etc. I always just saw the English button, but when I now press that button, I realized that basically nothing is translated and it's quite hard to find the information. So, so apologies for that. We'll, we'll have to do something and, and push Anna and, and everyone to, to, to get this information out. But I've tried my best to, to translate it for you today and, and we'll see how that goes. So I want to show you this picture of this great building uh, and this great architecture up in the north of Norway. And uh, for those of you who have seen this place before, it's actually it's actually a beautiful place, but this building, of course, is quite horrible. This is actually the Brønnesund Registry in Norway. It looks like this, uh, and it's it's not looking good. It used to be just that small red uh, sort of farm-looking house at the end there, but then there were so many businesses registered in Norway that it just exploded, and they had to build and build and build. And God knows what happened all the way to the left here, but uh, but we'll see. They have actually been awarded uh, 1.2 billion Norwegian krona to build a new uh, Brønnesund registry, which should have been open this year, but it will open next year. So that gives you a good reason to actually go to found to register your company in person to see. There's a beautiful landscape up there anyway. I haven't been there yet. I might do it next year. I've said 22 years now that I will I will go there. So Brønnesund registry keeps all. Uh, business types uh, and all registry. Also, uh, uh, if you are, if you are, um, if you have been to wedding, all, all these things that, that are up there, they uh, all, all registered in Brønnesund. So, the different types of companies, IT person for talks, the most common used for for visual artists. We'll, we'll spend most time on that, but there are also all kinds of associations, uh, uh, limited companies. Uh, partnerships and cooperatives that are that have their different kind of, of registrations uh, up there. So when you when you look at these different types of companies, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but choosing your legal structure, there's also a source link here. You can actually this is one of the few pages that actually is in English on the Bernison page. But you see the the, the line here with the uh, sole proprietorships. Uh, uh, it can have one number of owner. It's actually, if you have, uh, if you're married, uh, you can share that ownership with uh, with your um, husband or wife. But but you cannot uh, get more owners into a sole proprietorship. That is the basic of the Enket Tasuun for Uh There is no formal requirements. You don't have to have regulations for your entity. You can just uh, go ahead and register it. You'll get an organization number through Brønnesund. And, and that's basically, uh, and then you're up and running in no time. We'll come back to some of the, uh, the advances and some of the not so great things about that uh, company type in a bit. Uh, a lot of people ask me, uh, or, the, or they have this sort of imagination that when, when you know, when your company is, is small, you are a sole proprietorship, and when it grows bigger, you become an AS, and, and that you have more uh, deductions and, and, and easy reporting or something like that when you when sort of grow up to be this AS form, uh, the, the limited company. But that's not the case. The, the tax law is the same for, for all these entities. So it's not a question of that I'm not going to have this deduction in my sole proprietorship. I'm going to have it when I get an AS or I want to get an AS because then I can have a company car, etc., etc. Uh, no such thing. So just to take that off, it's one of the biggest companies in Norway is actually a sole proprietorship. If you've ever been to the Thun Hotel Group, uh, Olaf Thun, the, the old man with the red hat, and, the, and, the, and as you can see from all today's tax list, one of the richest men in Norway is actually run as a sole proprietorship. So it's a, at least part of the business as far as a sole proprietorship. So that's one of the biggest, and, and uh, just to have that uh, clarified. So. And cooperatives um, uh, are, are sort of regaining their, it used to be a lot of them before, uh, and now that's sort of coming back as well. And also in the artist uh, world where artists work together uh, on, on the same premises, etc. So we see that even more. Some of the uh, music bands uh, are, are um, listed as, as general partnerships because they have more than one, maybe five, six. Uh, uh, band members, and that's a, a standard form for that. But the AS form within the arts, not so much used 
uh, as, as in, in general business. So key features of sole proprietorship, there is an unlimited personal responsibility. Oh, I see a question, I see a waving hand. It's, uh, yeah, it's not just a question, but I'm just gonna uh, let people know that this will be um, available on YouTube later. So you can stop and, and zoom in if there's specific things you were asking about or wondering about. Okay. And, and also, we will send this PDF to everyone that has attended the course. Yeah. Yeah, we'll so, post it on this. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Perfect. Good, good call. Uh, so, yeah. So, the key features the unlimited personal liability. And that's sort of one of the downsides of the sole proprietorship because if you have caused the damage, uh, you are uh, unlimited. Uh, 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 li liable for, for those damages. So uh, uh, it, that's why you probably see in not a lot of auditors that run as, a, as an unlimited personal liability. But if you're working within the visual arts, the 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 um, the chances of you becoming personal or, uh, to get a really big liability towards your your customer or your client is is, is not so very high. Uh, so, and normally you can, you can get insurance that sort of cover these uh, costs. So, so it's really not the key point here. But if you're running as an auditor and you're signing off some big, big accounts and, and, uh, and uh, publicly noted companies, etc., the risk is very high. So you would not choose this uh, form for all, all entity. It can be owned by a natural person, of course, and you can, you can also uh, share, share income from it with, with your, your husband or, or wife. Um, you cannot be an employee. So you can have employees, you can have a lot of employees in a sole proprietorship, but you yourself will not be uh, registered as an employee. And this implies that you will therefore not get the benefit if you're out of work and, and uh, uh, as people who, who, who get a salary each month and then they're out of work, the state will take over. I'll come slightly back to that. Um, it's not a separate legal person, it's just an organization number, so it's the same. There is no separate law uh, for sole proprietorships, except all Norwegian law, of course. And it, of course, it's not very investor friendly. So if I wanted to invest in your company, I could not invest in the sole proprietorship. That would have to be a, 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 an arrangement on the side, if you like. So uh, those are the sort of the key, key issues. Um, some of them also, I just want to quickly go through the commercial activity is, is, uh, is there's no uh, limit uh, in, in terms of that. You can have your employees, but you will have other social security rights than you would normally have if you're an employee. So the sick pay, for instance, you would get, if you run your sole proprietorship, you would get 0% for the first two weeks, and then you'll get 80% of what you normally make from your sole proprietorship. If I, as a, as a receiver of salary, as an employee of a company, get sick, I will get paid from the company for those first 14 or 16 days, and then uh, the state will take over. So I'll basically lose nothing the first year, uh, up to a certain amount of income, of course, but, but that's the main difference. No unemployment benefit, and, and pensions you have to, to take care of yourself. Uh, taxes, we'll, we'll have a, a big chapter on tax, I'll come back to that. You have a question for me there, Oslo? Yes, there's a question here uh, from the previous screen. I have an ankle plus one's four talk, but also a band. Should we consider yeah. a general partnership business if the band grows to be bigger, as well as our individual ankle plus one's four talk for our other work? Yeah, and, and if you have an organization number and you're comfortable with, with, uh, with ha sort of handling the business and the accounting side of the band, there is no Sort of, uh, you can of course continue that because when you when you when you do a gig, you you can invoice the the the, the venue, and and the venue will pay you, and then you can forward if they, if the other band members have their own personal companies or sole proprietorships, they can invoice you for that, and 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 you know tax wise it will be basically the same. But if the business grows and and uh, the other band members do not have their own sole proprietorships, etc., we we normally recommend the 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 general partnership, the DA or, 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 or the ANS, Delta Galing at Sales Cup, which, which sort of regulates the, the band. Uh, and, some, and some bands have, have different kinds of income. Um, you know, they, they get 100,000 in and it's not split, it's not split five ways if there were five band members, etc. There's one thing we, we do mention is that 
if you exceed five bad members, you will get an audit uh, regulation coming in because more than five band members, the ANS or, or the, 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 the general uh, partnership will have to be audited by an external auditor. So that's one of the um, sort of slightly more cost-wise if you have, so normally if there are six band members, the, you might have the, the DA with the five band members and one uh, external uh, insourcing person that, that is sort of the last band member. So that's a possibility. Um, the VAT is, is the same. The VAT rules and regulations are, are the same. It, uh, doesn't matter if you are a limited company or a sole proprietorship, so that will be the same. I will, I will come back to the accounting thing. Uh, some, some uh, uh, for instance, what I do, accounting is, is, is uh, you have to have a permit for that. You cannot just start by accounting. You have to be uh, permitted by the financial authorities of Norway, and uh, you, you might have those, but those can be linked to that sole proprietorship. So, that's one of the uh, and the registration process is free. Uh, it's very easy and it's very quick to to get this organization number, which is basically an ID number for your sole proprietorship. So that was all I was going to talk about uh, on that. I am assuming now that most of you uh, following this this is like little course is is um, is running their business with a with a personal business with an organization number as a sole proprietorship or anchor that's all for the talk as we call it here in, in Norway. So when I go on from here, I will take that as as the sort of the standard. And then if you have questions, do feel free to ask about other entity types when we come to to, to that point. But uh, this is now is for the sole proprietorship. So visual artists, okay. So taxes. So the, the basic uh, the basic idea about tax is, is a, it's a financial charge um, uh, which is sort of uh, imposed on a taxpayer by a governmental organization in order to fund public spending. Uh, and and uh, this is one of the oldest paintings. It's, it's so many versions of this painting that uh, it's, I, I can't even recognize what is the original, but this painting is from some, some time in the 1500s or whatever, and it's called the tax gatherers or the, or the tax collectors, and and they're not very they're not very well painted. Uh, it might be technically well painted, but they don't look very good. They look like, they don't look like someone you would have come over for Christmas. So, um, so the, the idea about tax as a sort of like a, a negative thing has has been there for for centuries. So so we'll have to we we'll have to keep that in mind. I myself. Uh, I'm a very happy taxpayer because we we have a great uh, system uh, in in Norway. So uh, and there is a lot of focus on tax uh, at the moment, and especially today uh, because two months later than normal, today the, all the tax lists and and uh, income and and wealth uh, has been published in Norway in in all the newspapers. So you can read. It's going to be a lot of tax talks uh, in the, in the next days. A lot of people ask, well, what is the tax in Norway? It's kind of hard to tell. And it's not really so hard to tell because Norway is one of the many countries that have a flat and standard rate of tax. It's 22%, nothing more, nothing less. So what troubles this 22% is all the deduction sides and what income to ta is taxable and what income is not taxable. And a national insurance contribution and bracket tax and wealth tax and all these other issues. But the standard tax rate for all general income in Norway is 22% if you're living in most Norway, it's 0% if you're living in Svalbard, and if you're living in Finnmark in North Troms, it's 18.5%. But most of us will have 22% standard tax rate. So when someone asks you what is the tax rate in Norway, 22%. It's as simple as that. And then it's not so simple, I'll come to that. So, what we used to have, um, I couldn't find the, uh, I don't know if you want to help me on that, Aslak, but uh, I couldn't find the, the, the translation for a cocktail. Uh, you know, the old uh, phrase where, where someone made a lot of money, they would, they would say that they were a, a cocktail, which was a, sort of like a, a rich and horrible person. Uh, so, so the, the, when the tax, the, the phrase, the top tax was introduced, it was taxes on very high income. 
it's like a Scrooge McDuck. Um, he was a cuss. Yeah, yeah. So they, they used to they used to have that, and then and then realizing as as, as people started to make more money, etc. In Norway, they realized it wasn't uh, it was regular normal people who got this tax, so they couldn't sort of stick with the name of of a coxes cut and top uh, tax, etc. So. In 2016, we introduced the bracket tax, which is sort of like a ladder tax. It it sort of steps up, and and as you can see, it's not it's not from the, from the uh, if you can see the screen, it, there is no bracket tax between zero and 174,000 kroner a year. But if you're making over 964,000 kroner a year, the tax the bracket tax is 16.2 percent. So basically, what you're saying is that that if you make very little money in Norway, the tax is, is low, but if you make a million and above, you will you will basically be looking at taxes between 45 to 50 percent at the total. But not just the, the regular tax, but the bracket tax, the national insurance contribution, etc. So the sum of all these will, will sort of put you up in that uh, tax uh, phrase. I'll give you an example afterwards and, and, and show you how to, to calculate this tax. But the bracket tax, uh, as you can see, running from zero to 16.2 percent as, as the highest rate. So that comes in addition to the 22 percent uh, that I just saw you, which is the flat standard rate. All companies, for instance, like a, a limited company, pay 22 percent tax, flat, no more, no less. They have no bracket tax there. But when the owner of the company takes out dividend from the company, there will be new taxes on that. So. There is a tax, but it's divided into several uh, tax payers, if you like. So then we have, in addition to the, the standard tax and the bracket tax, we pay a national insurance contribution. And that is to make sure that the Norwegian health system is working, is working properly, etc. And you can see that here we have the sort of the first deviation between what someone who is an employee and gets a salary he is now paying 8.2% national insurance com contribution. But if you're working on your own and you're not employed by anyone, you have a sole proprietorship, the same national uh, insurance contribution is 11.4%. So there is a slightly uh, a bigger difference there. And the reason for that is that when you are employed, your employer pays the national insurance contribution at 14.1% on top of your salary. So there is a split here, uh, but if you're looking just from the private side of it, there is a there is a, a deviation of a couple of percentages. So we're paying a slightly higher tax as sole proprietorship owners rather than employees. But I will come back to that as well. Uh, oh yeah, there's, yeah a question. there's a question. Yeah, um, I don't know if you want to do this now, maybe later. Someone's asking if you could just talk something about. Um, um, pensions, perhaps later in the in the uh, in the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can discuss uh, discuss pensions uh, a little bit later. Yeah, when we come to the to the uh, uh, tax form, uh, there is a, there is a separate uh, pension uh, issue there. Yeah, so I'll come to that. Uh, and if I don't come back to that, please remind me again at the, at the end of the call. <laughs> okay, so. Other tax elements that I wanted to bring here, we have something called the personal deduction, uh, which is a standard deduction that everyone gets. And this is why we in Norway have the, you know, there's a phrase called the, the Scott de Free card, the tax free card. Uh, it's not really a free card. It's not that you're, you're free for paying tax, but it, in the, the general idea is that you're not paying tax uh, on income below 56,000 kroner because this standard deduction that everyone has uh, sort of takes your if you're making 56 kroner you have the standard deduction everyone has it and your taxable income will be zero so so it's and and, and obviously companies don't have this but, but income from sole proprietorship will still be uh, on this uh, personal uh, deduction that everyone has and this is one of the things that uh, all who sort of take on work uh, gets this deduction Except when you're dead, uh, there is a separate tax class for for uh, for handling your taxes when you're dead. So that's but obviously that's not a preferable uh, uh, tax uh, deduction to, to 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 get when when you're dead anyway. So and then we have uh, something that I have been personally uh, um, I would say interested in and and uh, sort of skeptical too because I've always said that uh, Minsterfrag is one of the things that really is. Uh, 
is um, is, 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 is sort of benefiting uh, employees rather than uh, persons owning a sole proprietorship. And the reason for that is that means to follow, which is a standard deduction to salaries and pensions specifically, and not to sole proprietorships, that is now, it's, it's been growing every year, and then it's it's 45% of everything you do. The, the lowest uh, it's, it can be, so the standard is 31,800, uh, and the maximum is 100,800. So it's always 45%. Never lower than 31, never higher than 100. So the Minister Fadag, if you look into what it was supposed to do, is to make you ready for work. So you're saying that, well, if I'm an employee, I have costs of going to work. I have to go to work physically. I have to put on my clothes. I have to read the newspapers to stay uh, to stay updated on things that's happening around me. So I have a cost of taking on work. And they say that, well. This minister father, that's when you are an employee, but you're not going to get the minister father when you have a sole proprietorship or you have a company, because then you get uh, deductions for your actual costs of running your business. And, and we agree to that, but these deductions have been reduced and reduced and reduced every year. You know, 10 years ago, you can get a standard deduction for working clothing. Now, the standard deduction for working clothes is zero. You, you cannot deduct uh, uh, working clothes if those clothes can be used normally. So if you if you go in a suit, or if you go in a regular sweater, etc., of course you get for your helmet and for your masks and things like that. But regular clothes, you're not going to get a standard tax deduction for. So so slightly along with the years, this Minster Follow has, has become sort of favorable to, to the, the, the employees. And I know a lot of uh, sole proprietorships that struggle to find 100,000 in costs if they're just writing a book or, or, or doing things that, that are not very high cost driven. And they would love to say, well, screw this whole accounting thing. I'd rather just take 100,000 off my income and, and, and bring my taxes down. It would be a lot easier. Uh, and it'd be a lot easier to, to do the tax reporting, et cetera. But unfortunately, one cannot choose now. Uh, maybe in, in some years time, you can sort of choose between if you'd like to have your actual costs, which are lower and lower and lower, or this means to follow, which is actually increasing every year. So at one point in time, maybe I will live to see it. We'll, we'll have to see, but uh, that should be this should be great. Yeah, Otto? Yeah, I uh, actually got four questions here already. Mm. Are profits from Anchor Plus One's Fortag treated the same as employee earnings in terms of paying the Trinskat? It's the same, the, the bracket tax. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so the bracket tax is the same for for all uh, for all income types. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what if you are both employed and you have a sole proprietorship, tax wise? Yeah. The, the previous slide you had something. Yeah, and, and I will I will show an example of of, of a person uh, that has both these income types, and I will, I will thank you at the text on the next page. page. Yeah. Cool. Um, if I take income from my one-man business, is this calculated as dividend? No. Okay. No, so, so dividend can only be paid out for, or based on shares. So if you have shares in a company, and you cannot have any shares in a sole proprietorship, but you can have shares in Equinor or, or any limited company uh, that can pay out a dividend. But uh, but on a sole proprietorship, you will be income uh, for the for the difference between the the income and the cost that you have, uh, no matter if you use the money or not. So we'll, we'll come back to that as well when we go through the tax papers here. Good. Um, mm. And as a request, at some point, could you talk about the pay scheme and when it would be a good idea to take up, good idea to take or give up that tax? Yeah, the, the, the payment plan for the, for the taxes if you're running a sole proprietorship or... Yeah, if you, if you press because um, of a Q&A button on, on your bottom right there. You can read the question. Uh -huh. The second question. The payee scheme. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. The the payee scheme for foreign workers. That's that's the uh, that's a completely different thing. So that doesn't uh, necessarily mean mean the sole proprietorship. So we we won't come back to that. But uh, we can we can do that in a. 
breakout session afterwards if, uh, if uh, okay. possible because that's cool. completely different uh, so yeah yeah so let me let me come back to this one here so look let's quickly talk slightly about the wealth tax in norway which is the formula scott which is a lot of uh, focus on this uh, in these days of course uh, and uh, some of you have also probably read up until today, today is going to be a lot of focus on it, of course. But uh, in, in just a couple of weeks, uh, weeks ago, we, uh, we started with this wealth tax discussion because Bjorn Dali and uh, some of the other uh, rich persons and Bjorn Dali obviously being the, the great uh, biathlon skier, etc. And uh, moving to this uh, commune, uh, I can't remember the name of that commune, but but somewhere in Norway in order to, to reduce the wealth tax. Because the wealth tax in Norway, it's 0.85% of your net tax assets. And the net tax assets is not the same as money in the bank. Money in the bank is, is sort of rated as one-to-one. -one. So if I have 10 million kroner in the bank, my wealth tax uh, will be calculated based on those 10 million. But if I buy an apartment for those 10 million, the wealth tax um, uh, value of that apartment might be somewhere in the lines of one and a half, two million. So there's a huge difference between the ratio on this, uh, meaning that 10 million, I will have to pay wealth tax. 2 million, I will pay very little wealth tax because wealth tax starts at 1.5 million and upwards. So as you can see on the scheme here, uh, it's 0.85%, which 0.15 goes to the state and 0.7 goes to the communa. So what this communa uh, somewhere in Norway has said, that said, well, we'll, we'll drop that. We don't want that money. So making it quite... Uh, uh, interesting to move to that communa, of course. Now, just to take the richest person in Bergen, Tron Moon, he has a net wealth uh, of, of 4.6 billion. So, if he, he so he pays about 37 million uh, in wealth tax to Bergen communa, and about six or seven million to, in wealth tax to the Norwegian state. So, if he moved to that communa, he's actually paying 36 million something to, to live in Bergen every year. So, that's a great. Uh, some to pay for for uh, the beautiful weather that we have here. So he would be one of those who, who might be interested in to moving to to that special communa. So that's quickly about the wealth tax. So let me give you an example. Uh, so we have Kari here, uh, and we say that 2019, which is the last uh, fiscal year that has been ended by by the tax authorities. So she had a salary of 500,000 and net income from visual arts of 150,000. She also had an apartment without debt with a tax value of 2 million. So no debt, income of 650 in total, but split between a salary and a sole proprietorship. So what will Kari's taxes be? Now, this is going to be a, a lot easier to see when you, when you get the PDF from me, but let me show you uh, this calculation. So if we go up, I don't know if you can see the cursor on the screen. Is that possible? Uh, or can you see something moving on the screen up here? Yeah, yeah. If you if you really go into the screen, you can see. So you have the salary here at five hundred thousand. I talked about the minster fardag, which was a hundred. So the the tax base for that salary would be three hundred ninety nine thousand two hundred, and the sole proprietorship is one hundred and fifty. So the sum of six fifty, and you get no minster fardag for that. Uh, and then you'll have a net base salary of 549,200. And then you take out the personal standard deduction for all living persons in Norway for 56,000. You get a tax rate or a tax base of 492. If you multiply that by 22%, you're paying 108% standard tax. Yeah. And then you see the bracket tax, which is zero on the first income, and then it's 1.9, 4.2, and nothing because she's not making more than 964. So the bracket tax will be 21. And then you see here the split of national insurance. So it's 8.2 on the 500,000, and it's 11.4 on the, on the 150, giving national insurance at 58. And the sum of income tax is 187,000. And then she has to pay slightly a bit of wealth tax on the number exceeding the 1.5 million. So 1.5 minus 2 is 500,000. So if she pays 4,200 in wealth tax, giving her a total tax of 191,993, amounting to 29.54%. So if she had 
200,000 more in, in, in from the sole proprietorships, the taxes would look different, etc. But on this type of income, you'd typically be looking at about 30%. So if we we normally say that if you are making up to about 600, 650,000 kroner a year, you might estimate your tax is going to be one third of what you're making. And then you can, if you if you go up to about a million, you're probably looking at somewhere in the lines of 35 to 40%. If you, if you exceed uh, a million, You'd be you'd be coming up to to 40 to 45 percent. And just put some examples here. So if you're making 400,000 a year, you're paying about 25 percent tax. If you're making 10 million a year, you're making about 45 uh, percent uh, tax per year. So does that sort of the? So it's not as I said before, it's not as easy as 22 percent. Although the general tax rate in Norway is 22 percent, it's all the other issues that sort of make this slightly more complex. Okay. Yeah, I just I just noticed there's a link on that um, foil where, yeah. where you can calculate your taxes basically. Yeah, and, and that actually works in English. It's the, one of the few things that works at Skatteetarten. Even though the link is in Norwegian, you can actually calculate your tax in English. It's uh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, so you can look into that, but just to give you a, a quick overview on how taxes are calculated. And you can also see this if you just got your, your tax uh, uh, report for, for 2019, you can see this calculation on page two or three or four or something like that, depending on how many issues you have in your, in your tax report. So it should, it should all be in there. Okay, so, so the frequency of the, the payments um, normally you have uh, four payments a year. Uh, it's always 15th of March, May, September, and November. Uh, and it's all four. So if they say that, well, Christopher, we think you are going to make a million next year. We think you should pay 400,000 in taxes. Well, they're going to send me a bill at 100,000 for those four dates. Uh, because of the COVID-19 uh, situation this year, the, the first two uh, payments of the year were actually extended to May 4th and July 15th in order to, to give people some slack and, and to, to try to, to raise money for the tax. But next year, we still don't know. But we think it's going to go back to the standard days of, of March, May and September and November. So this is actually based on an estimate. And every December, amount, about these days here, I think sometime, then maybe this or next week, you are going to get a message in Alten saying that this is your tax card for the next year. And it's very important. It's very important to be optimistic in life, but if it's one place you can be slightly pessimistic, uh, it's on this tax card and rather come back with your optimism as you see the year coming in. So it's not illegal to say that, well, I'm hoping to make a million next year, but I'm gonna start pretty slow. It's gonna be a slow year. We don't know what's coming. I'm gonna start off with 200,000. And if I see that you know I can make that money, then I, I will, slightly increase the tax code uh, during the year and, and pay more taxes as we go along. And you can also pay an additional tax in order to not have any interest uh, on your tax return within May 31st next year. You cannot say that you're going to make nothing and then make a million and pay the tax next year. Uh, that's not legal, but you can you can definitely be slightly more um, pessimistic on, on how much you, you think you will pay. Uh, because this is this is quite the tough. Uh, 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 this is like the painting I showed you earlier. I mean, if if you say that uh, you you're going to make that million and you get this bill for a hundred thousand on on March fifteenth, and you don't pay that bill, they can actually collect all four uh, bills. So uh, there are rules and regulations for them to do that, and they're going to hang on you. So by the time you come into the summer, you're you're bankrupt and uh, and turned uh, personally. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if you showed that on the previous um, slide, but um, did you add debt to your to your taxes? No, Kave was in a very fortunate position, and she she didn't have any any debt. But uh, but she could have had. So she could have had uh, one million in debt. That would only uh, influence her wealth tax. So if she, if that apartment that was valued at two million, if she had one million in in debt on that apartment, it would bring her net. Uh, value uh, lower than the 1.5 million where, the, where the, the, the wealth tax starts. But the interest rate, that will come up uh, sometime. Oh, sorry, let me just go back.
Let me go back to this slide. So the interest rate that she would have, so say, let's say she had a 2 million in debt on this apartment, that would give her no wealth tax because her wealth would be sort of taken out, but she probably have a couple of, let's say she would have 100,000 in interest rate. That would come up here and take off uh, this amount here. So it would be 492 minus 100,000 in interest rate, and, and this will be 22% uh, lower or 22% of the 100,000. So if you're paying 100,000 in interest rate, uh, you'd actually get a tax break of 22% directly on the interest rate. And this would also include like student loans and that type of debt. Yeah, yeah, for all interest that are, that are paid. <laughs> So, but uh, but uh, we, I mean, we even have people saying that, well, you know, I should I should have more debt because they, because I can get deduction for the interest rate. Well, you know, if you pay a hundred krona to get back twenty two, it's not a very good deal. I can make you an even better deal. You can pay me a hundred, and I'll give you back eighty. You know, it's 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 a horrible deal. So, <laughs> so it's no it's no it's no use to sort of increase your costs in order to get the tax. If you don't need what you uh, are paying for you're still getting back a very, very uh, small amount of, of the token. So just to be, just to be clear on that. Um, yeah. And if you have okay. in other countries, does that matter? Yeah. So, so it, when you are taxed in Norway, whatever you have, wherever you are in, in the world, it, it, it all comes back to Norway. So if I have an apartment in the US or the UK or somewhere, uh, that information would be brought into my Norwegian tax and I will pay taxes as if that property was located in Norway. But I will get a deduction if I have already paid taxes on it in the UK or, or, or somewhere else. Okay. So there is no, there is no, Norway has, uh, has a tax uh, uh, treaty or a tax deal with almost every country in the world. And the country that they don't have with, uh, it's probably not a very good country to be in. I don't think we have a... North Korea, for instance, but uh, but for, for, for basically all all countries, we have a tax treaty saying that to to uh, exactly to avoid double taxation. But but when you are living in Norway and you're taxing in Norway or you're taxed in Norway, you, your your whole worldwide income and your worldwide net debt will come into the, you know, your Norwegian uh, salary and and, uh, and tax report, and, and you will have to make sure it it uh, sort of uh, it, it is the total full report. Okay. There's quite a few questions here, but I think we we'll just go through this and then we can take it. Yeah, on the end. let's let's, uh, let's head up to, to look at some deductions and, and we'll come back to, to some more questions. Uh, so so this is a weak translation. I apologize for that. The Norwegian tax law was not translated in English as I hoped to find on the internet, but uh, but I tried myself. So basically, tax deductions are giving for costs incurred to acquire, maintain, or secure taxable income. Not every income, but taxable income. And there is there is a difference here. I'll come back to that. Uh, regulations that clarify, extend, or restrict tax deductions for these costs are given in a separate uh, part of the law. And, and I, I have to tell you, it, it, it's quite extensive. So there is more uh, talks about restrictions rather than uh, on the income side, if, if I can be clear about that. So no deductions are given for private costs for the taxpayer or his or her family here in living costs, food, and expense. I couldn't find the great... Uh, um, the English word for underhold, but what I mean by these expenses here is, for instance, if I needed uh, someone to, to watch my children as I was doing this work, I would still be doing it for, for, for gen generating a taxable income, but it's relating to my children and, and my family and living costs, etc. So I would never get the tax deduction for that, even if it was a necessary cost. And also, you cannot get, uh, I always use the example when I do the tax courses about the band that, that you know, missed their plane uh, to Oslo and had to, to run with a car really fast over the mountains, etc. And, and, and get a fine for that. Uh, and they come to come to Oslo to make the performance and, and to do whatever and get the taxable income, you would not be able to deduct the fine because that is a, uh, you are breaking the law and that's not, uh, uh, one of the few things is that you can actually park and get a parking ticket and that's still tax deductible as long as you haven't parked, uh, if you have parked correctly but you have forgotten to pay or your payment runs out and you're still in the meeting, that is actually deductible parking cost, even though quite high parking cost. But it's uh, it's one of those very few things that uh, 
uh, you get a you get a fine for and you still get the, the, the tax. So, so that's sort of the basic rules of tax. And if, if it was this easy, it, it you know I would be out of a job and everything. So so it's a there's a lot of issues uh, uh, talking about these things. So I'll try to to go through some of them. Um, if you have all the time in the world, and I know that you don't, but there is a Bible of all tax deduction. It's called the Scott the ABC, the last uh, published November 25th, the last year. There will probably be a new one. Uh, it's 1,694 pages, so it's quite, uh, quite uh, extensive. Uh, and it, it increased by almost, it normally increases by 62 pages uh, every year. So it's more and more reading and a lot of, of information here. Uh, as an artist and as a visual artist, you have, the, you have your own chapter in this book. You are uh, actually on, on five, uh, five and a half pages, uh, where unfortunately it's not translated to English, but if you, if you throw it into Google Translate or something, you might be able to get some of it uh, there. But there is a slight chapter taking what you normally have at expenses and talking a little bit about that. I will, I will do the same now. The biggest difference between working as a visual artist, Billy Kunstner, rather than working as an accountant uh, in terms of your tax position, is the principle of when the income is recognizable in your accounts. So what I do is that it's based on the delivery. So if I deliver this course today, today is the day that my income from this course will be calculated in my accounts. It doesn't matter when Oslock pays, uh, if I send him the bill tomorrow and he pays, you know, five years from now, I still have to uh, tax it today. As a visual artist, it's the exact opposite thing. It's the when that you get the, the payment, that is the main issue, or the day that you could have got the payment. So if, as I said, well, if I was a visual artist and I was drawing a painting instead of holding this course, uh, I could say, well, uh, you know, I... I then Oslock is ready with the money, standing there, money in hand, I want to pay you now. And I say, no, 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 wait till next year because I've got a lot of income this year and next year is a tough year. So I don't want to, I want, that's not uh, doable. So the day that you, you, you could have got the payment or, or the day that you actually get the payment, that is the day when you can deduct or you, you put your income in your tax report. And also the same goes for the cost. So if I pay for a new computer today, I will get the tax deduction today. If I pay next year, it's going to be next year, even though I got the computer today and the receipt says today, etc. It's the date of the payment. Uh, there is also, uh, there was a question about inventory uh, on your own art production. And, and there's a specific, if you follow this cash principle, cash basis principle that I just talked about, you have no direct, on all your costs of production, paint, uh, uh, canvases, etc., etc. It's directly deductible. So even if you make a painting that's later sold for for a million, there will be no inventory value on your uh, on your statement. Uh, the only thing is that if you if you buy in several other painters paintings uh, and you keep them for later resale, then you would have an inventory of whatever amount you paid for those paintings. But that's paintings for later sale. That's a different thing than what you actually produce on your own. If your gross income is less than 50,000, you don't have to use the standard formula and you can use a very easy and, and, and uh, quick way of tax reporting. So that is a limit there on 50,000. So if you don't succeed that amount, then you can just put your direct cost in, you can put your 46,000 kroner and your direct cost of 22, and that's it, that's all you do. So no big form and CVs and, you know, talks about how many exhibitions you've had, et cetera, et cetera, in your tax form, all that goes away. It's a very easy tax situation to be. I'll show you that uh, on Austin just uh, quickly. So let's talk about some of the issues. And in, in this is in alphabetical order based on the chapter that I showed you in the Scott uh, RBC. Uh, just quickly, uh, some of the typical issues. Working clothing, I've just been through that. If you can use that clothing on a normal day-to-day -day basis, you don't have a deduction for it. You can buy it, you can use it, of course, but you're not going to get a tax deduction on, on working clothes unless it is uh, working clothes that are not uh, usable for private use. And that's helmets and you know sho shoes and, and uh, outdoor uh, uh, working pants and et cetera, et cetera. Newspapers, uh, also, uh, you don't have a standard deduction for a newspaper, but you can have for your second newspaper. So if I have two newspapers, I have one, 
which I just follow on the private side, and one that I, I, I have for my job. Typically, we have a bag and steed and dog and snake sleep. I say, well, bag and steed is for my private needs, and the, the dog and snake sleep, I will deduct that uh, directly. Telephone and internet cost, that used to be a horrible uh, uh, thing to calculate because you'd have to have a specific phone bill and you have to scroll out, well, that was a private call and that was a company call and that call I probably shouldn't have made at all and that was very late in the evening, et cetera, et cetera. And you get your deduction for whatever call you made that was connected to your business. That era is uh, luckily gone, so now you have a standard deduction. Whatever you have on telephone and internet usage, uh, if you have 20,000, you can deduct your 20,000. You just make a, a, a small deduction as a standard uh, uh, private deduction at 4,392 kroner. God knows where that number came from, but that is the number that's used. So if I have 10,000 in phone bills, I will get the deduction for the difference between 10 and 4,392 kroner. So there's a specific place for that in the tax report. I'll tell you that as well. If you have your office at home, uh, like most of us have at the moment, I'm also sitting at home. I've been sitting at home for quite some time. I don't have a deduction for this office because it's part of the rest of it. Even though I rent this house, it's part of the living room, which is right over here, etc. So I have no. It's not a. It's not a separate uh, um, uh, office. So even though I'm using it every day, I don't get a deduction for it. Uh, if it had been a separate room that was only used for an office, and none of my kids were on the floor, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, then I would be able to deduct some of the rental cost. If I had owned this house, uh, I would not be able to, to deduct a lot of it because basically I haven't had quite a lot of costs of owning a house because the prices on houses have gone up and up and up uh, and, and basically a, quite a good reason why there is not a big cost of, of having this office at home. If I had in the basement that I was rented out, it's a, it's a different uh, case. And of course, if I rented offices somewhere else that will have a full, full standard deduction. Uh, cosmetics, basically not used for, for visual artists, but for, for the, uh, the persons or the artists that you, you might uh, uh, paint or something like that. Uh, cosmetics is an, a deductible. The big, the big trouble is, is, you know, what is your work cosmetics and what is your uh, uh, not, uh, or private cosmetics? That's a, a big issue too. To find out, and then all these artist salaries, artist scholarship, they have their own rules and regulation. Normally regulated when you get it. So if you get the Kunstlern from the the Stuchting or the artist salary from the government, it will it will tell you how how it's going to be taxed, etc. Uh, rental income is is a taxable income if you if you sublet your atelier or, or your office. Um, literatures and magazines are uh, are deductible if if it's sort of related to your work so not see or her and and uh, magazines like that but uh, obviously all art magazines and and uh, literature going into to talking about art and, and and relevant issues and also if you have a project if you're going to do a big painting or, or do some project on see or her you can obviously buy quite a lot of sale her magazines to, to to relate to that but that is a different project cost and you have to uh, you have to argument on that in, in your tax report I'll, I'll say a little bit about that when we come to the tax report as well so one of the things is is the costs for staying outside of residence and and uh, you know you have the artist in residence program and you say well you know I have four kids here at home I cannot work here I have to go away uh, for for three weeks in order to get some work done uh, is this a standard can I get this deductible? And and uh, the issue is that well, uh, normally you can't uh, because just the reason for to be isolated itself is not a good enough reason to get the standard deduction. But if I have to go to a studio to make uh, music, I can go down to Kigo, which is a couple of hundred meters from here. Uh, then I would get the, the deduction from 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 the cost of, of renting myself, even though I stay there for for three weeks. So. That is that is that, but but I wouldn't get I wouldn't get uh, uh, you know food. I would have to have food if I'm there or here. So food I wouldn't be able to, to deduct uh, even though I'm uh, outside of the home, etc. So there are also some separate rules and regulations so that we have a completely separate course on all, all these issues uh, connected to, to that. But normally it goes slightly further down here. The travels for study, the studio I saw. That is fully deductible if it's something more than just a general inspiration tour. So it's actually 
stated in in these uh, in these uh, lectures that if if you're there just to be uh, you know oh I'm you know I'm been at home for three months I'm not inspired at all I need to take the trip uh, to to get a general inspiration that would not be deductible but if I said well I'm going to do some uh, landscape paintings on Iceland and uh, I have to be be at Iceland to 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 have a look at this view and these landscapes etc. That is, a, that is more than a general inspiration. It's a very concrete inspiration and would be uh, tax deductible. Education is not tax deductible, but if you maintain, if you're already an educated artist and you, and you take courses, if this was a paid course, you would get a deduction for that. It's all a matter of, of, of maintaining uh, your work, but, but the standard education, uh, your bachelor degree or your master's degree can never be uh, deducted as, as a cost. Uh, documentation co uh, or uh, photo documentation of your work, etc. It's, it's, it's also uh, deductible, but not what we call in Norwegian the utklips tjenester, which is when you hire a company to to to, to find uh, newspaper clips of you or, or someone else or, or uh, whatever. That's uh, actually, in fact, not uh, deductible. So that's a, a small, uh, strange thing there. Um, equipment is fully deductible. Uh, there were some questions about depreciation. Depreciation, I'll come uh, on a separate slide. Uh, inventory, we've already talked about, and some of these honorable, uh, honorable and cultural prices might be tax-free. Uh, so, but that was also if if you get a price like that, it will be stated if it's a tax-free price or not. So uh, we won't go into all the prices that are not, and, and uh, that will be also a separate course, I think. Uh, we've talked a little bit about office rent, uh, computer and equipment. I'll come back to that under, under um, and depreciation. Internet, we've talked about office supplies. Of course, you have a lot of office supplies. Insurance, just quickly on that, you, you would have a, your, if you buy your pension insurance for your own, that would be a deduction because pensions, when you take out your pensions, that will be a taxable income sometime in the, in the near or very long future. So, so you'll get a deduction for whatever you pay in pensions now, if you have a separate pension scheme. Other insurance like travel, like the general travel insurance, your housing insurance, et cetera, will not be uh, deductible. That will be looked at, looked upon as a private cost, but your extra insurance, your uh, auto insurance, your uh, uh, freight insurance, uh, your uh, uh, extra insurance on your on your office or your atelier, uh, in order to, to to make sure that the value of the art can be at least be uh, paid by the insurance if it if it burns down, etc., or theft or anything like that is of course fully uh, deductible. If you have web pages and domains, that's also fully deductible, and the amount you spend on on commercializing your web page, etc., it's uh, it's uh, deductible. Goods for re uh, as, as as you're running a normal shop, so it will be also be deductible upon sale. Uh, if you buy any things, it will be on your balance sheet, and and, and uh, yeah, well, I'll show you slightly about that as well later on. Uh, and other operating costs, uh, a lot of the costs, uh, if, if it's related to your office or your business, uh, it's, it's normally a, a deductible cost. So uh, we'll come into that when we look at the actual tax reporting form, which has several, uh, several points for all of these issues. Well, let me just quickly say we got a lot of questions on, you know, do we have to use uh, an accounting program? Do we have to use FIC and then we, if, when we only have the one or two invoices a year, et cetera, et cetera? And the answer to that is no. There is an exempt and, and it's it's called by, by the Norwegian Accounting Standards Board and it's something called NBS 6. And it says it's the use of text uh, behandler program, which is basically Word, Excel and, and those kind of desktop programs. Uh, if you can, you can actually, you're actually allowed to use that for bookkeeping as long as you are within less than 600 transactions per year. So if you have a, run a small business and you have about 50, 60 um, um, uh, transactions per year, and one transaction with sale of an art or a purchase of a, a canvas or, or, or a purchase of a, of paint, etc. That's one transaction. So if you have less than 600, you can actually uh, keep your books in Excel or Sheets or, or Word or, or, or wherever you like, uh, as long as you, you sort of keep it uh, and and uh, can 
at any point for a potential tax uh, officer visit, uh, reproduce it, of course. Um, and the, the, the same is with, with sale documents, invoices, but that's a slightly different uh, angle on that because the invoices, they must be, if you, if you don't use a, a, a program that sort of automatically generates the next number, uh, you can do that, but then you'd have to print it on pre-numbered forms or uh, on, on paper or use a program that sort of you cannot alter. So if I issue an invoice, that issue, that invoice can should not be altered with a recognizable uh, program. And which is basically you can have a PDF uh, uh, a converter or, or, or whatever. And then most of the programs today are easy, but th at some point they have to set the line and they've just said that, well, it's a, it's with, they cannot be altered with known programs. So if you, if you run it into a PDF, that's normally accepted as, as uh, un, un, uh, uh, altering uh, um, program, yeah. Was like. uh, is it true that you you start at every calendar year from from scratch? The no, it, it's just uh, no. You can you that that you can choose. So the regulation just says that you have to have an automatic numbering, and it has to be so. You, there's not a. It has to be a tight series. So there cannot be a hole in that series. And if I've issued an invoice, I cannot uh, 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 I cannot alter it. Uh, then I would have to make a credit note and a new correct invoice. Or if it was just one part of the invoice that was wrong, there is a, a separate GBS one. It's called it regulates the use of credit notes and how you uh, and how you sort of use that. But uh, yeah, someone is saying now you can make uh, twenty invoices per year with Quanta. Yeah, there's a lot of free programs out there who sort of take on this uh, very very easily. So it's not a it's not a big. Uh, but I, I I understand if if you're selling, for instance, to buy in Comuna or any public or or, or, or a slightly larger company, etc. They would demand your uh, invoice to be in a separate EHF format, uh, which normally is, is, is you have to pay a price for an EHF invoice from one of these free companies. So that might be. But if you're selling to, to private persons, uh, it's it's not a, it's not an issue. And there's a lot of programs out there, Fikin and Conta, and all these um, different programs. So 600, that's the number to, to remain uh, noticed on if, you, if you're not using uh, an accounting program. Yeah. Um, there's about 10 questions here. Do you want to take them now or, or, or go on? Let's have a look at the questions. See if... Uh, it's the Q&A. Should I read them up? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going slight to food. So the so the uh, the project grant that I will come to. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I have no idea how much money I'll make. Can I opt to settle my taxes at the end of the year? Well, uh, well, you you have you have some time during the year to sort of figure that out. So I would say that if you're very unsure about your income next year, I would say you go out low and you say, well, I'm not sure. It's not going to be a great year. And then when you make a hundred thousand, you report that, so you can at least pay taxes on that, and 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 be and, and set aside, of course, um, some some money on the way. So that's my. You still pay four times a year, but you just increase it if it if you. Yeah, you increase it. So normally, uh, you, you probably pay nothing on the first one, and then when you come out to May, you say, "Well, I, you know, I think I'm going to make a hundred thousand this year." You you'll get a hundred divided by the three, less or remaining. Uh, uh, Okay, so uh, yeah. you, can, you can actually not pay at at one point on the first. Well, you can do it. You can do it, but if uh, it, it's it's not an impossible thing to do, then you'll have to say that next year I'm going to make zero, and then the next year you pay the tax uh, in advance or in, uh, in within 31st of May next year, or you just pay when you get your tax report saying that you have a lot of uh, vest cut. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the next year. You're not going to be able to do the same because then you, they've noticed that you're uh, there is a slight deviation between what you say you were going to do and what you did. So next year they're going to give you a new tax card with probably higher than uh, what what you made that year, and that, it's going to be a lot harder to change that down. Hmm. So uh, yeah, so and there's a question here about uh, if we have salary as an employee and a sole proprietorship as artist, do we estimate the tax card for both income? Yeah, 
So the, the tax card is your full income, both your salaries and uh, and your artistry and your wealth tax. And uh, if you have, uh, if you rent out an apartment or any other kind of income, dividend income, etc. So your tax card will be a full, almost like a tax report. Um, if you want, if you make phone deduction, do you have to be able to prove it with bills? Yes. That is correct. So you have to keep the bills and receipts for everything that you do uh, in, in your business. You don't have to send them in with your tax report, but you have to keep them for, uh, I think it's five years uh, to, to make sure that uh, and after five years, you can throw them out. But uh, you have to keep all your receipts uh, for, for five years. And then there's a question from Karin regarding telephone internet. Can you deduct for the internet you have at home or just for the studio? No, both of them. So uh, if you have for the studio and also you're using the internet at home because you're working from home, etc., you can add those up and then take off the 4,392. Uh, over that, uh, Christopher, with the, um, can the cost of taking Norwegian course be counted in deduction? No, not not to not to learn the language. That's also as as sort of like a basic. Uh, uh, if it if if you look at um, uh, if you were employed somewhere and and your employer pays that course from you, you will probably get a, a, a tax. Uh, let me just quickly say uh, tax. I have a Bible here. I uh, assume is using all my uh, internet access. <laughs> I'll come back to that later on. But uh, no, I don't think uh, the Norwegian course is, is tax deductible. Um, can you claim an artist scholarship as income next year if it's already been paid into your account? Yes, you can. I will show you that uh, uh, in, in the actual tax form. Um, What if I have been given a stipend for specific uses and those aren't tax deductible? Well, uh, uh, it's, it's very seldom that you get a stipend for something that's not tax deductible, um, uh, like like to buy uh, spirits and uh, and uh, travel. Uh, and, and that's not tax deductible. So uh, that, that is a very unfamiliar situation. But if if so, uh, then then you would actually be taxed on uh, on. Uh, the, the, the difference between what the amount you get for the stipend and, and what you, your tax deductible uh, uh, costs are. So, can you deduct tax from NAV's compensation for self employed? Uh, NAV's compensation, when you get that compensation that is a taxable income as as any other income because that's supposed to replace your income so yes uh, that you have to pay tax on that um i have a designated home office separate room attic floor how do you work out the percentage of the house rent claimable for this space that is the that is the standard um uh, area so if it's a uh, quadrat meter in a week in the car i remember the english uh, word yeah yeah, yeah. So that is so. If it's half of your apartment, you can deduct half of the rent. Uh, it's a, it's a basically that if it's a designated uh, home office. Uh, I have a tax card as an employee in a company, but I cannot see, but I cannot see my tax card as my sole proprietorship. Uh, we can't, if you can't find the line on it, that's probably because it's not there. Then you can go into the Scott Etat and you can add that line. There is a separate line. I will show you that uh, a little bit afterwards. So, shall we go on with some of the? Can you take out the questions that I have answered, last like, and then we'll come back to some questions. Let me just quickly talk about depreciation. So, depreciation is a way of of, of saying that if you buy something that has a lasting value, it's supposed to last more than one year, and it has a, a, a cost that exceeds 15,000. And remember, this 15,000 is now a very low sum. It's been the same since the late 70s. So a lot of people are talking about that sum should be 50 or 100. But anyway, it, it sort of goes, it goes to say that 
if you buy a color printer, which is which is one uh, one example that I've put up here, they say, well, you're going to get the deduction for that color printer, but you're going to get it over the years we expect it to to live. Because come next year, you can sell that color printer and get uh, seventy thousand or eighty thousand or something like that. So it definitely has a net value. If you buy something at ten thousand, it's very likely it's going to have a very high value in a year or two. So. What you say is, well, you're going to get the depreciation, but you're going to spread it, and it's actually over 10 years. So if you buy a color printer for 100,000, it's categorized in these saldo groups, the groups of different types of characters. Like if you buy a building, it's a very low percentage. If you buy a helicopter, it's a low percentage. If you buy a big cargo ship, it's a low percentage. The highest one is office machinery. So if you buy a personal computer to do your accounting, that is in the highest group. It's group A with 30% depreciation per year but a machinery uh, used like a color printer for your art production that's going to be in group d which is 20 percent per year so basically the first year you were going to get the deduction of 20,000, which is 20 percent then you're left with 80,000. that is your new book value on that then you get 20 percent of the 80,000, which is 16,000 something and then you get 20% of that again, it goes down and down and down. And the last year when it sort of drops under 15,000, which was the original amount and the, and the limit, uh, then you get the full deduction. So you see the depreciation, the tax depreciation for this machinery is split in actual 10 years. And there are separate tax forms in order to keep a track of this machinery throughout its sort of living time within your sole proprietorship or company or whatever. So that's, a, you get a full deduction, but not the first year, it's going to be flattened out through many years. Uh, that's sort of the key about depreciation. So let's look at some of these uh, uh, standard forms. It's just, there was a question about uh, purchasing something from private persons uh, somewhere in these, uh, in the pre-work here. Uh, so there is a regulation about documentation of sale or sales documentation. When you when the seller is a private person, those rules do not apply. So it's basically up to the buyer and you to make sure that you can can legitimately document the purchase that you have made. So if you buy something from fin.ano, it's actually if you want to get a standard or, or, or deduction for that cost. It's up to you to make sure that you get some kind of invoice or some kind of documentation that shows the value of what you've gotten and the money that you've paid for it uh, and why it is, it is important for your, for your business. So there is also a regulation on, on reverse invoicing where you can actually issue the invoice on behalf of the seller. That's a, a good option. Or you can make sure that you have, you can take a picture of the object, you can take a picture of the, of the ad uh, on FIN and you have your bank transaction or whatever you pay for that. And, 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 and the sum of that will sort of legitimately document your, your purchase there. So hopefully that answers um, that question. Let me talk to you about and show you uh, Altin, which is a uh, the sort of the portal. Uh, the English translation for that would be everything in. Uh, which is the, the, the government, uh, uh, where, where basically you put everything, more or less everything that goes back and forth from the government, except for NAV and some other uh, things, but all reporting, tax reporting is done through Alton. So when you log into Alton, you, you, you come into this and you use the bank either to come in there, etc. I'm, I'm thinking that everyone has, uh, has gotten in there. Normally, if you don't have any, if you're not sitting on any board or anything like that, it's going to look something like this. It's going to be your personal self, where you see the small uh, person here, and you would have your uh, business as two things. So your business is lying here with an organization number. But if I am to report my taxes, I am reporting my taxes as a private person. So my business is a side of me as a private person. So I don't click on my company to report my taxes. I click on my company to report if I have employees in this company or if I'm paying VAT in this company or anything else that relates to this company. But the taxes are put on me as long as this is a sole proprietorship, I'm responsible personally for those taxes. So I click on my personal uh, side here. So I come in, my uh, Alten uh, unfortunately is, is uh, completely defect because I have uh, access to thousands of, of companies and a lot of information uh, here. So I have to do something to, to compress and to look at this last month or something like that in order to see anything at all. 
But normally you can come in here and you can see this here, where you see your uh, your skattemelding and you have your uh, RF uh, Reinskapsformular, it's called, uh, tax report 1030, which is the tax report for any wealth and income uh, uh, taxes. This should be in here. You get a per you get a deadline of the 31st of May each year. Last year it was sort of extended. Uh, if you have something in here that says uh, as a as a salary receiver, learn small talk of, and your deadline is on the 30th of April, you need to make sure you need to change that. Then you go and need you you need to. Uh, uh, go into to, to, to make a new form and it's this RF 1030 that you would need to post in order to to uh, get to use the Billikens or the visual artist reporting form that I'm going to show you now shortly. So I click on this and I click on the go to the actual form and I come into this picture here and let remind you this is the first a lot of people they click on this and they see this and they go oh shit I can't do this and, uh, and they just uh, go out and have a drink or something, uh, but, and, but it's not really that complex, it just looks horrible. Uh, so you can actually, as a visual artist, you can look away from everything here, except for the RF 1242, Nairings of Gala for Bilder Kirchner. So this is the report that you are going to use, unless, like I talked about a little bit earlier, unless it doesn't exceed the 50,000. So if your gross income is less than 50,000, then you can click on this without the standard form. You can just click here, continue, and you put in your income of 45,000 and your cost of 25,000, and that's it. Here in that, you go into the uh, RF 1242, which is the Nairing Sopkala for form. Now, this form is, can only be submitted electronically to the tax return. It, it, it's not going to have any attachment. The only attachment that we, we normally put in here is your, is your CV. To, to, um, uh, to give uh, accessible information on, on your artist uh, career so far and your education, et cetera, because there are questions about that in this uh, tax report. Um, if you have, there is one uh, artist that cannot use this, or one artist type, and that is if your net assets are over 20 million and or if you have more than 20 full-time equivalents. So, so Damien Hurst would probably not be able to use this form had he been living in Norway because of his production factories and, and, uh, and high, uh, high uh, cost of machinery, et cetera, et cetera. But everyone else would then be uh, be able to use this Bellicus Opgar. So the first page is where you have to pay, make sure you, that you get a distribution of the rent between your atelier, your studio, and your private residence. So this is to show that, well, I'm, I'm, my studio is at home, and, and this so-and-so, this is, the, this is the, the question that was here earlier, you know, how do I make up this? Uh, I'm renting this apartment, and they are using the loft as a studio. And as a, this is where you would have to put whatever you pay in total of rent and, and electricity, etc. And you can say, well, on the private residence bit, I'm paying this. And on the Atelier Neistel, I'm paying this. And this is where you actually split how many quadrat meter or, or square, meet, square meters are in the different types of categories. If you're not having your studio at home, you can just skip this part. But it's, it's mandatory to actually report this in your tax report. Okay, so when you do your accounting, and then even if you're not, uh, even if it's a long time until you're producing your tax report, we recommend to keep your accounting in a way that you you stick to these uh, lines here, because when you come to your tax reporting, you are supposed to report. There is a difference. You can't not just report your total income. You have to report if it's sales from your studio, your private sales. Uh, if I come directly to your studio and I purchase a painting from you you have to post it in this point 2.01, sale from atelier, private sales, or sales from studio. But if you have sold anything on an exhibition uh, from VISP or, or someone like that, you are supposed to split that sale and show it on a separate line. Nobody would kill you if you put anything under, everything under other income, but you, 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 you increase your risk of getting a tax uh, uh, um, run through or, or, or a visit from the tax people uh, is if you, you're not able to split this. Because when uh, when you get your tax return of the year uh, or your tax report, your preliminary tax report, 
some of the you, you might realize that some of the, your customers have reported that they have paid you some money or some of the exhibitions that you have are reporting this etc so you might have uh, numbers already sitting in your tax return which you are supposed to exclude from that and only keep in here but you have to be able to produce this split so other sales exhibition fees uh, scholarships you put in here, etc. This is where you put your gross scholarship. So if I get two hundred thousand in uh, in, a, in, a, in a scholarship, even though I'm not going to spend more than fifty this year and one hundred and fifty next year, I put in two hundred thousand here, and I will show you how to exclude the remaining uh, part of it. Uh, concept, yeah. Yeah, I was just. Would you recommend that um, if you do your own accounting that you, for instance, um, save all documents about sale from Atelier, like in 201, as like, that's the way of... Um... Yeah, yeah. So so if I was if I was a visual artist, I would I would probably have a serious accounting program because I'm specifically interested in that. But uh, I would most likely also have an Excel sheet. And I would say, that, well, I have this 2.01, all the sales from here. I would list the person and the name and the date and, and, and you know, what, whatever... Uh, work they had they had uh, um, uh, bought from me and, and i would list the amount etc and i would make a sum of that okay i sold 150,000 worth from from directly from my private sales and i would keep uh, track on a separate excel you know or, or in the same but in a different sheet uh, i would keep track of whatever the gallery sold for me etc etc with all the names and yeah but to try to keep your income uh, split into these uh, categories that's the that's the main issue and 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 just to correct myself so if i get this scholarship because that was we have a lot of questions on this scholarship if you get a scholarship of two hundred thousand and i'm only spending fifty thousand this year you you write fifty thousand here and you show with a remark that you are postponing your remaining hundred and fifty thousand I, I will get to that point uh, later on but just to be very sure on that. 50,000, whatever you're using this year goes in here. What you are postponing to next year comes in a separate uh, box. I will show you that box. So, income from uh, artistic assignments and consultancy. And remember that if you are working on the side here uh, as an accountant, for instance, uh, that's a VAT applicable service. And that's not. To be so if i have if i am a visual artist and i have this but i also do vat applicable work as a graphic designer or, uh, or an accountant or whatever that's a different form and you have to report that separately so that cannot come in here even though it's other income so no vat applicable income goes into this uh, formula here then i'll get my sum of gross income here uh, which is the big pen and then we come into the cost Specifications. And the cost specifications are split as this, and this is also what we recommend that you try to keep a po post of, you know, what are you. There was a great form. Uh, uh, if, if you were in Excel, and you can write all your typical costs downward, and you can just mark them by 211, 212, 213, etc., etc., and then you can do an easy filtering of that uh, later on when you're doing your annual accounts. But just make sure you get a list of whatever you paid for the different times. So. Biggest one, or the first one, is the cost of materials. Sorry, let me just go back to. Uh, cost of materials. Uh, and then you have, if you have employees in your, uh, in your sole proprietorships, uh, you have payments of salaries, holiday pay fees that you have paid to your employees. So this is not based on yourself if you have if you're employed somewhere else. This is whatever you pay to your employees, and also if you pay national insurance on your uh, employees' uh, salaries. So two twelve two thirteen is only for use when you have employees. Two fourteen you have cost of professional assistance and hired help. That would typically be uh, accountancy etc. is further down, but that would typically be if you if you get uh, professional assistance with your work, you get someone to mix your paint, or you get someone to to uh, stand the model or, or, or whatever you need. Uh, that goes into that two point fourteen. 
Uh, 2.15 is cost of production assistance. So if I hire someone to help me with the production or to, to manage, or to make sure that the freight goes there and to book the gallery and, uh, and everything like that, that goes into production assistance. Photo and documentation of work is a separate post. Uh, and then other external help, which is typically legal help, accounting help, audit help, etc., goes into a separate account, 2.17. So the 218 inventory and equipment that has a cost price less than 15,000. So when I talked about the depreciation, if you get something that's less than 15,000, you can directly deduct it in this uh, line here, this column. Um, if, it, it's, if it's over that, the whole amount goes into a separate depreciation form, which we'll come back to when we, when we get to that. So this is only for whatever is less than 15. Maintenance of the cost uh, premises are here. So if you have a studio and you have to paint it or you have to uh, change the, the water is broke and you have to change the plumbing, you're not upgrading it, you're not building something new for over 15,000 kroner, your, all your maintenance cost goes directly into here. And then you have to split the other cost of premises, which is in rent, electricity, and if you have the studio in your own private residence, that also is split into a separate uh, post here. Freight, uh, exhibition costs, a lot of these things are, are, are obviously self-explainable, but just to give you a quick overview of what you um, what you what you will be looking at when you when you do your annual taxes and try to keep whatever expenses and income you have in, in line with these posts because this is what your end reporting is going to look like. Um, and electronic communication in business, that's where you put in your full electronic cost of, of, your, of your internet and your, your telephone bills, etc. all goes into here. And then you put that the standard form on the next page. I'll show you that quite shortly. Uh, fuel, if you have a company car, fuel maintenance, insurance, tax, and renting, rented parking, garage rented, etc. Uh, for company car goes into a separate post, but then you have to use a separate form as well and the use of company car. Um, a lot of people ask me, you know, I, I'm going to get a new car. Uh, why I'm going to need a car next year? You know, should I should I buy this car in my company or should I buy it privately? And I would say in 95 percent of the cases, we recommend to buy it privately because what happens is if you buy a used car, these rules will will be your uh, you will be taxed on the new car value. So if I buy a used car, I'm going to drive 2,000 kilometers in within my my visual arts work every year. I will be uh, I would get a 75% taxable income, but not based on the 50,000 I bought the car from, but the the new, the new price that the car had uh, you know five years ago when it cost 600,000. So I can actually end up with getting a tax taxable income that's higher than my actual cost of the car. So what we recommend is you use the form on the next page, which is basically 3.50 uh, for every run kilometer. And, and you make a note of it. Well, today I went from Bergen to Stavanger to visit uh, my exhibition and I drove back. That's, uh, I don't know, 500 kilometers times 3.5 and I deduct that amount. That you can do for up to 6,000 kilometers per year. And a lot of people... Uh, um, yeah, sort of limit the driving to up to 6,000 within the, the, the work, of course, of course. So other cost of business. And if you have other costs that are not listed in any of these uh, points here, there is a mandatory specification for all those uh, posts. So let me show you quickly. So you get a sum cost of tax deduction and you get your business profit. And then to, to uh, calculate what is taxable out of this, you have the same number here as 250. So if you're left with 150,000, like a car from the example we used earlier today, uh, we plus the private use of the company car, which I said that can actually be higher than the cost. So that's not a great uh, way to go. Or you can deduct the use of private car and business, which is maximum 6,000 kilometers times 3.5. You get a profit. And then you have something called a profit and loss account. And uh, I just said call for help. If you, if you have that, it's a complex thing. That's if you, for instance, if you sold uh, your machinery that you bought for 100,000, the color printer, if you sold that for 150, uh, you're not supposed to be income by the gain, you, the gain you made that year. So that can be postponed to next year. So if you sold it for a lot less than the book value, you can also 
to that uh, over several years. So that's a different, uh, I just say call for help if you, if you have that, but most businesses don't have that uh, thing. And then your income or loss is transferred to tax return post 276. And this 276 and 3219, those two posts are the same in the tax report as they are on the tax card. So back to the question is, if you have only see your salary on your tax card, you go into the Scott Dead Totten and you put in your 150,000 that you think you make for from the visual arts post and you put you find that post 2.6 and you put that number in there and you find the post 3219 and you put that number in there. So that's that's uh, sort of the, the uh, direct uh, posting through, through that. And this is the post that I wanted to talk to you about, the unused scholarship. So if I get a scholarship today for 200,000, and that's reported as my income for 2020. Obviously, I'm not, even if I drink a lot of good wine, I'll probably have a hard time to spend that money before New Year's Eve. So I want to use that money next year. And so I said, okay, I'm going to only buy materials and stuff this year for 50,000. I put 50,000 on my income statement, as we saw just a previous places ago. And then uh, I'm going to put the remaining 150 here on the depth, this 0 0.3.08 depth in business. That's where I put the 150. But I also need to make sure that I sh I'm showing that I still have the 150 on my account. If I've used all that money, then I am, I can try, but I will probably not succeed in saying that I'm not going to be taxed for that money before next year because then I've already used up the money. But so hopefully I have the 150,000 remaining on my account. So I'm going to put that in here and I'm going to defer the remaining 150 for the scholarship. I'm going to put that in here. So both of them equals to zero because this is a plus and this is a minus. It doesn't, it doesn't give me any uh, sort of tax benefit or not. It, it just shows that I have uh, deferred it till next year. So that's where you put in, uh, in that. Okay. And then there is a last page on this Willikunstopgave where you give your information about artistic activity. And that's more or less upload your CV uh, to answer all these questions. There is a question about your... your um, exhibitions, how many collective exhibitions, uh, separate act, uh, what kind of uh, scholarships you've had, if you are uh, represented in larger collections, how many competitions you've attended in the last 10 years, etc. So this is just trying to, 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 uh, to, to give you more uh, a sort of base of, of what you actually do as an, as an artist and, and probably also to, to avoid that people that are not artists are trying to claim uh, this uh, reporting type. Uh, that's, uh, it's, I've, I've, I've never gotten any questions in 22 years. We've never seen any questions relating to this page, but we also almost every time just upload the CV because that sort of says more or less everything about uh, his career uh, so far. So, and we reported young artists and, and uh, very old artists. So it's, uh, it's not a big uh, difference there. So before we skip into the last uh, page, it's going to be a very short there on, on the end. Let's try to dig into some of the open questions. So like, should we go to the top? So we have answered 21, I see on my screen, but uh, I don't know if that, correlates to your screen yeah um well the project grants question is you you would wanted to do that in the end have you already answered that yeah so so that's that's uh, that's uh, what i just said about the the reporting so if you got a grant in 2020 for a project to be developed in 2021 you, you hopefully you have the money you put that in your uh, your post that I just showed on the screen, and then you put also the depth in there. So you put, put, put post, uh, postpone it, defer it, and then you make a small note of it. Is that yes? I have received the grant in 2020. And it will be used in 2021. Uh, and there was one question about prepaid taxes. Yeah, uh, I've not paid any of the advanced car uh, car taxes this year. Estimating yeah. less than fifty thousand. Yeah. Am I in trouble? What's a wise step uh, in this situation? Well, it, it doesn't sound like you're in deep trouble. I, I know people that are way more in trouble than that. Uh, so so the 50,000, I would just recommend because, because both, I mean, all these four tax paying deadlines are 
are through. Yeah. So if you report that you made fifty thousand this year and might be even lower when you when you on this course and you you see that you have some some uh, de depreciable costs or, or costs to do to take out of there etc but uh, I, I wouldn't do anything i would just sit uh, in the boat and maybe take you know i don't know what your other income is but let's say you take maybe 20 percent 25 percent of that amount and you put it in as a as a separate uh, advance within uh, the 31st of may next year and then you report, I don't know how this sort of goes into 2021, but let's say you made 50,000 this year, maybe you'll make 100,000 next year, you, you report that on your tax card and, you, and you'll get uh, four, four bills from the tax authorities in 2021. Next question, I guess you already answered, can you claim now? Yeah, can you claim, yeah, yeah. As income next year, if it's already yeah, as long as you as long as you have the money, that's sort of the main issue. You, yeah. you don't stop using that money, and, and, and then you can definitely postpone it. And what has to be included on this word Excel bookkeeping? Well, well, um, if you read the link that uh, I will send you on the PDF, there is a lot of information on how to uh, to do it. But but basically, if I'm, you, you know you need to keep track of the dates, the amount you paid, what you paid, who you bought it for. Uh, uh, who you bought it from? So, sorry, and why? Uh, the reason for it. it doesn't have to be a, a long one. But if it, I mean, if you buy, if you buy a, um, you know, if, if you buy a piece of piece of paper, you don't need to specify that that is a piece of paper and why you need that piece of paper. That's sort of self-explanatory. But if you buy a goat or a uh, something that's sort of slightly out of the ordinary, I would suggest that you, you put in a small note on why this goat is. Well, you know, I'm going to put it in form of hydric and, and divide it in two and put it in one of these glass uh, things and, and sell it to uh, Rasmus Astrup. You know, that's uh, you, you need to make sure that you put in an explanation if it's something that's not self-explanatory. And also, I, I believe they would, if they are... Um doing their own bookkeeping there are not using a um, program like Feek. And so it's important that their invoices have their organization number. Yeah. Um, yeah, unless you're buying from a, from a private person or you're buying from a country that's not, uh, that doesn't have the same rules and regulations that, that, yeah. that we have. Yeah. So if you, there was a question there somewhere, uh, I think also if you have, what if you bought something from abroad? And, and normally if you buy something that's used for, for a business, you would have to import it to Norway. So it's not a good thing to you know buy something for a hundred thousand abroad and not take it into Norway uh, in the in the, you know the normal channels. That would you may be in trouble with some other law, but but there is no difference in terms of the usage. So if that color printer was from uh, Sweden or something, it would it would still be deductible as long as you have a receipt for it. And it probably says on your on your bank statement um, the. Um what do you call the um, valuta? The, the yeah, yeah. So yeah, so the the yeah the exchange rate will be on there, and what you pay for the Norwegian value is will, yeah. will be on your credit card or your bank statement or, or whatever. So that's uh, hmm. and and uh, let me also say that uh, uh, you mentioned the bank statements. A lot of people think that you know the bank statements is good enough documentation, but the bank statement is just the documentation that money has been transferred from me to you. It doesn't show what the money was for, and that's why you need the extra, of course, the receipts to show what was the product that was. Uh, yeah. And then I got a culture water scholarship, and it's already showing in Scott Tetasna's category of income. Yeah. Uh, and it shows taxable amount of zero percent. Yeah, that's because it's not because it's tax free. It's because it's not tax. Uh, uh, deductible when it's paid out. So a salary, for instance, if I'm to pay uh, to be paid a hundred thousand in a salary, uh, my employer would have to deduct tax because that would be illegal to pay out a salary without deducting the tax. But some of these depends and scholarship are not taxable upon payment because it's assumed that you will have costs that are related to this scholarship. That's why you get the full amount, and then you are to report yourself the payment but this is in your uh, tax report you you take that amount out and you put it into your billikunstnopkam so if you're going to use it this year or use a lower amount you report it as i as i discussed when i was on the page where where you put your debt in in uh, business mm. 
And can I just leave it out of my business accounting since it's already showing up? Yeah, you can, but then you you are sure to be taxed on the on the gross amount. And and obviously, I think you would you would prefer to have your costs deducted uh, in, in forehand in order to. So what section would sales made online fall under? For instance, when you sell a series of prints through a web store. So uh, looking back at the Billikunst Opgava, I think that would be uh, sales from exhibition as well, because uh, uh, the the internet sales, so the internet is, a, is regarded as, a, as an exhibition in, in, in this case. So. So we have, uh, what if my company is a combination of artistic and commercial practice and I earn more than 50,000 in a year, for, for, but for example, just 10,000 is artistic. In, not in, yeah, so, so basically if, if your artistic income is, is sort of the lower, then that's not your main income, etc. cetera, you, you might want to try the other nailing uh, subcover or the other reporting form. That's on there. That's on the alt and then you just report ten thousand as as income outside of the VAT area. I'll, I'll come to that slightly when we get through these last remaining questions. And um, I assume the CV section for artists would be venues performed if you're a musician. Yeah, but if you are a musician, uh, you are not uh, you are not uh, using this. Uh, 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 that is only for visual artists so if you are just a musician uh, in, in these terms you would have to use the standard uh, there is unfortunately not the separate one we will, have many years been, been arguing to get a Nahringsopgave for all artists because it would be easier it's easier to sort of fill out this form it sort of relates more to what you do rather than a musician which you're using the same uh, Nahringsopgave as the Equinor or any other commercial company is using so you, you struggle to find the posts for, for musical instruments and, and tour dates and venues etc so but uh, that's one of the things we'll have to look forward to in the future. Uh, the can questions, I think, are related, aren't they? It's about the installments. When, and yeah, so can you show in Scott where we put in estimated income for sole proprietorship and how to split it with income from salary? Yeah, I can, I can show you. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I cannot show you live, uh, but I can put in a, a small in a PDF that we send out because I have to take out my personal number, etc. So if I try to log in. <laughs> you have all my uh, personal data. <laughs> Take up a big credit in my name. <laughs> so yeah, uh, but it's it's the same post. The post two point uh, two seven six and three two one twelve. That's the two places where you put in your office uh, income. How do you pay the four tax installments throughout the year? I have only ever received a tax rebate. I have no uh, had to pay money back at the end of the year. Yeah. So, so if you are, this, it's it's all about this tax card. So, if your tax card is correct, and that includes uh, you making money uh, from a sole proprietorship, uh, you will get a automatically generated invoice in your Altin portal. Uh, and if you're not on there, you'll get a you get the bill in in the mail. And if you don't do anything, you'll they'll be knocking on your door uh, at about uh, 45 days after the due date. So uh, you, if you're registered correctly, you'll definitely hear from them. They don't forget you. It's very, it's very sad. Uh, okay, so if you're an employee as a consultant and I've paid a salary before, uh, by invoice monthly for a period you're responsible for your own tax return, how would you state that in tax return? Yeah, so, it, so the consultancy work is... is, is is basically the same. It, it's an it it will be taxed the same way as artistic income, but that will be as I said, it it not be the cash principle. It will be the day that you actually deliver the service. So, if I deliver the service now in December, I send them a bill on the thirty first of December. I get paid in January. As an artist, you would be taxed in January, but as a as a consultant, it, it will be an income in December this year. I would report it in a naring subcover in a tax report, but not the visual artist report. So uh, if you look at the Alton um, page, let me just quickly run through that here. Uh, I think it was this page here. 
So if you if you go back to the Alten, you would probably use the Nahingsrapport Scott or Nahingsrapport One, or if it's less than fifty thousand, you would use the, the the last one here. So that's how you report the consultancy. Uh, what if you received the stipend earlier in the year before your business opened? Can you still claim it as income and make deductions against it? Yes, yes, and you can also run. As, as a self-proprietorship without even being registered in Norway. There are many artists, uh, musicians, and, and painters, etc. in Norway, they don't even have an organization number. But that doesn't, uh, the organization number doesn't give you uh, the right to deduct. That is what if income. So the organization number is just an easier way of maintaining and, and, and uh, sending invoices, etc. But a lot of them don't, don't even have it. And you can, of course, and also, I forgot to mention that if you are not making any money this year, you only have costs this year, you, you would actually be able to report a loss for 2020 in which would be deductible if you have other income. So if I'm starting out as an artist this year, don't think that while I haven't had any sales yet, I'm not going to deduct any of these costs. Yeah, you deduct all the costs, even if the sales come at the, at the later, later stage. We have to start somewhere and that's uh, still deductible even if you don't have uh, income yet. Okay, so what if my art practice cross over theater and visual art, which form should I use? Well, depending on where the main uh, cash flow is, I would say. So even though you're doing a lot of everything and theater and everything, if, you, if you're mainly, uh, if your main cash, uh, if you're making 200,000, I don't know, uh, uh, if your 180 comes from your theater work, you are delivering not the visual arts. Part. Then the visual arts part is, is sort of the, the smaller uh, part of it, and the other way around, you would you would deliver this, and you would report the the twenty thousand uh, theatrical work as other income. I have income from a to my enkelt person for a talk from some freelance work as an artist assistance. It's less than the amount. Yeah, and a, again, that's uh, that's other income. Uh, uh, if it's uh, if it's uh, lower amounts. Um, um, thanks for the music regarding musicians. Thanks for the info. I am a visual artist and musician. So do I submit taxes using 1030 and 1242? Well, depending on what, what is the bigger, like the one, uh, the question with the theatrical work and the visual arts. So the biggest one chooses the Nowing Subcover, as you can see on the page here. Um, so if you have both paid income from employers and also income from an artist, you have to fill out two forms, uh, both nice of Gava Scott and Utenayas of Gava. No, if you have income from employers, that will be automatically put on your standard tax report. So that will be on your page when you come into it. So if you're working at, uh, at PwC like myself, the income from PwC would be stated in my tax report. And then I have to take my artist work from the side and put it into this narrowing subcolor. If you have an organization number and registered an association with its board, and if you are producing project and artistic cultural events, can you register yourself and be hired as an employee of the association? Yes. Is there a way to be employed all through? You will have to do the work for the association to get funding. Yeah, so, so um, uh, can you, I mean, you can be employed in an organization or association without receiving a salary or receiving a very, very low salary or salary dependent on future uh, funding, etc. So that's, you can still be employed. But the trouble with that is it, it doesn't sort of give you any, uh, any, any rights. So, uh, uh, yeah, so the, the best way would be to, to be fully <laughs> employed with, with, uh, with uh, your income. Yeah. Um, can you just upload your usual CV or should you copy sections into the form? No, just the usual CV. Um, yeah, unless you have something unusual in your CV, but uh, I would say that uh, the, the usual one is, uh, is uh, more than adequate, as long as it answers more or less the questions that are asked. So that's, uh, that's a good idea. I had a brief look at section 276, other income in the tax portal. It mentions that you also have to fill in sections 162, personal income. Yeah. So uh, if you fill in the same number, does the tax office consider them as different? Well, they're not different. They are actually just the, the, 
the, the basis. Uh, so if you have 150,000, you put 150,000 in point 276 and you put 150,000 in point 162 because in 162, that is the definition for the national uh, uh, insurance contribution, which was 11.4% or something like that. And the point 276, that calculates your 22% tax and the bracket tax, if, if you get that. But that's a, uh, on 150,000 example, that's below the bracket tax uh, rate. So, uh, so it, and many people, it's a good, good point to take up there, Max, because a lot of people get scared. Oh, I think I'm going to be double taxed for this. But, but everything in the tax report, starting with 1.6, is personal income, which is only applicable for the national insurance contribution. So, well, answered 41 questions, and I don't know, if, I don't know, because I can't see who's who's on here, but uh, maybe all of you have logged out. Uh, hopefully, there are still some people left uh, to, 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 to go through the last three. Um, still 37 watching here, and oh, that's, uh, yeah. people watching it live on YouTube, I think. That is impressive. This is, uh, I, I'm fully aware that this is a very dry uh, material, so uh, <laughs> my apologies for that. Maybe there's something wrong with me. I don't know. I was going like this. So uh, let's go on to the, uh, let me just quickly run through these. And of course, we, the, the, the tax, the art tax, uh, we're not going to discuss that. This is completely tax, but just as you know, it's there. And, and these web pages are actually in English, so you can read all about it there. It doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, do anything plus or minus with with the VAT. So let me show you this a very um, specific drawing of uh, of uh, what I call the VAT house, just to make sure that, you, that it's sort of as simple as possible. So the VAT house is a very complex house. It's sort of generated by the value added tax law, uh, which is quite uh, uh, it it would be easier if. Everything in Norway was VAT applicable, no exemptions, etc. But it's not. There is different rates. There is high rate, low rate, middle rate, and there is also rates that are not on here for some specific type of fish and farming industry, etc. But the big thing is you are either within the law, you're inside of this house, or you are outside. So art in general is exempt of the law. So you're not even within the law. The law does not apply to you. But you can be within the law and still have a zero rate VAT. And this is where the confusing part is, because if I go to the bookshop, the book salon in at Literaturus and buy a book, the VAT rate is zero. That is because there is a separate rule in Norway saying that when you sell books and literary work to the final user, the end user, it's without it's, it's zero VAT rate. If I go to Svalbard and buy something, it's zero VAT rate. So there are other reasons for these uh, products to be sort of zero VAT, but they're still VAT applicable. So when Buxalong had bought this book from Forlag Central or, or Askhaug or any publisher, there is VAT on that bill. They get a full deduction for that, but the sale to the final person is zero rate. And if you are within the law, you also have a full deduction for the VAT cost. So if I am doing my accountant, for instance, that is fully VAT applicable. I have to charge 25% on my bills for the accountancy, but I also get a full deduction for the VAT. So if I buy a computer and I pay 25,000, I get a full 5,000 kroner refund on the VAT and the cost that goes into my accounting for tax purposes is the net cost, 20,000. But if I'm outside of this VAT house, this exemption, uh, then I have no VAT on my sales and I get no a deduction for the VAT. So I pay the 25,000 uh, kroner for the computer, and that is my full cost, even though it's only costing 20,000 plus VAT. So that's sort of to try to explain. So let me show you a lot of text on this. I'm, I've highlighted what is important because in the value added tax law, the reference to the art has its own chapter, it's chapter 3.7. Uh, and it's all types of art. It just it talks about theater, opera, concerts, and circuses, etc. And it's also very specifically uh, talks about this exemption does not include striptease. It's actually directly in the law. This striptease clause. It's quite fascinating. 
but it's number four and five here you can see uh, originate this turnover sale of own art and rights to his and hers own literary and artistic works are exempt from the VAT law. The same goes for turnover and sale by a middleman agent gallerist in the name of the artist originator. It has to be in the name of the artist and originator. If it's not that, then uh, it's actually VAT applicable, the, the, what the gallery, uh, gallery uh, does. And also the, for middling, the display brokerage, I couldn't find a great word for that. Oslo you can help me with a great translation of for middling of art. But uh, uh, on behalf of the artist is also exempt from the VAT law. So there is no VAT um, relating to this uh, post. And then let's go back to our questions and see. I think mediation is a good word for, for middling. Mediation. Mediation. Mediation, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, uh, three more questions. Oh, there's a Norwegian question here. We have to translate. Uh, I am in an art group and have a responsibility for the accounts for the whole group project. Uh, consultancy and, and uh, uh, external help to my project. Uh, yes, that is uh, correct. So then yeah, you're using uh, this, but you're reporting the gross amounts. Uh, that's a question from Mari. So uh, if you're getting 100,000 for this project, but you are three other artists that are in and I'm going to get 20,000 each, they are defined as uh, consultants uh, to, to this project. And in their uh, form for Billikens, they report it as other income. But she puts it in her own form. Yeah. That's what, yeah okay. she, she takes in the gross amount. That's the, sort of the, the, the main... Uh, uh, person or the, the responsible. So, Laura, if you make a loss for several years, will you lose your anchor person photo? No, but you get a letter normally. I know I noticed it's 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 coming quicker and quicker, but it depends on how you define quick. We normally see the letter in year four or five. Now we've seen these kind of letters on year three, asking that. What, what are the plans? Please provide your business plans. We're seeing that you're losing money every year. Why are you continuing on this uh, horrible project or whatever? Uh, you know, you're not, uh, is, is this, are you able to make money on it in the future? And then you have to report the letter and saying that, well, you know, it's normal and uh, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and all that. And, and, you know, they give you slack for another couple of years. But, but there is no uh, there is no limit. I mean, we, you know, you can see startup companies uh, going on for years and years and years, continue to make huge uh, losses, and some of them never make a profit at all. But but that doesn't mean it's uh, it's uh, not tax deductible. So yeah, so make sure you get everything in there. It it takes some time to. But if you get one of those letters, I. Uh, Call, call someone as well, yeah, because you don't want to answer what you feel you want to answer. You want to answer them in the way that they ask the questions. So that's a, that's a good point. Slightly different topic. I have a question about working as a collective. If you're a collective of three people, apply for funding together for project, is it worthwhile to get an organization separately for the collective? Well, if it's just that one, one project or two or three, I, I wouldn't recommend it. It's going to be a lot of accounting work, although I live of that, but it's going to be a lot of accounting for nothing. So uh, I would say that to do as Maria did here, uh, she took charge. She got the whole scholarship into her account and divided, took all the costs in and, and divided the remaining parts from, from whoever was working on the project. But make sure you're working with people that you can get a receipt from. We've seen cases that, you know, someone like Marvin does this, but then unfortunately one of the artists uh, was always bankrupt and never was able to produce any invoice and and, and the person lost the uh, tax uh, deduction for that cost because it wasn't documented properly, although the person got the money, etc. And then our main person here, here was taxed at a higher rate. So. Make sure you're working with uh, uh, both good artists and, uh, and uh, with some uh, accounting skills. Yeah. Um, and what is the top question here? I have a sofa. I, I have a non-art related business alongside. Would it be better to create two businesses under one company or make them two separate companies? I, it, in fact, I don't think you can actually get two organizations number uh, two organization numbers from Brennison. So you can't register two, but you can have several. If you go into Brennison, you can have several 
uh, uh, you can be registered under both, uh, you know, uh, visual arts, kunstenrecht, uh, werkzaamheid, and also as a dentist. So you can have several types of businesses within that same organization number. Although I've seen a case where a person had actually two uh, organization numbers, but uh, uh, normally you're not able to do that and you have to, to split up your, your business. Um, and there is also a post to do that. Then, depending on what which was the biggest, but you could also say that uh, if, if you use this nine sub cover one and you calculate with well, one million profit, but 200,000 came from artists and uh, 800,000 came from uh, fish farming and uh, and I lost uh, 200,000 on this third, you, you'd, you'd actually be eligible for that tax law. So you can, you can split your income in different types of uh, uh, business. Can I um, ask a question from which I received on email? Um, yeah. I'm currently a student in Norway and will be graduating in 2021. I hope to stay in Norway for a time, but my understanding is that neither my current visa or a job seeker visa will allow me to sell my work as an artist independently from a tax perspective. Is this correct? Well, it, it depends on um, if you can get a, uh, you get a Norwegian D number or the, the 11 digit uh, personal number, which is your identification number to get, you can't get the Brønnesund uh, registry without it. And uh, if if you are working uh, as an uh, and if you don't have a work permit for Norway, then you're probably not eligible to 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 do the work uh, within the, or without the the tax law anyway. So you probably wouldn't be able to 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 deliver um, a tax reporting in Norway. But uh, huh? it's just some more here. I just want to add that. Is it possible for me to work as an artist without being self-employed? Or will I need self-employment visa to work in my field? For instance, could I sell through a gallery here and pay tax through that or keep my art income under a certain kroner amount with that while working another job? Well, if, you, if you're working another job, then you are allowed to work, uh, I would say. so. And, and if uh, you could still work as an artist uh, uh, without uh, having a specific type of income, and if your income is less than 50,000, you don't have to apply for the full... Uh, Hmm. Uh, tax reporting, etc. It'd be a lot easier to to report. But, you, but whatever you do, you you have to have that eleven digit personal number or the D number to be able to to report anything in in Norway. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. There's two more questions here. I think we'll just do them and then. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what if I sell an artwork abroad uh, and was produced abroad? How can I declare it? Well, it 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 would be the same as if it was sold. Uh, in Norway and produced in Norway. So if you have costs relating to that artwork, those costs go in. Uh, you have to convert to Norwegian kroner, of course, and, and also the sale uh, as if it was sold and produced in Norway. So you treat it uh, exactly. And if you then have tax, say this was in Spain, if you have uh, paid pay taxes for that profit of that sale in Spain already, uh, call someone again and make sure that you you yeah, because there is a separate tax form in order to get that tax deduction to avoid double taxation in, in two countries. So it's that tax treaty between Norway and Spain or whatever country. Yeah. So what is the nice of government form for art consultancy services and is art consultancy accepted from VAT? Well, yes, normally uh, the, the curating of art, etc. is, uh, but if you if you're just working as uh, uh, as as an art consultant, uh, and you're not selling any work, you're just you're just performing or building up a collection or curating a collection or something that normally would be a VAT applicable service uh, and wouldn't give uh, you the chance to to use the Billikens Nobkov. Then you'd use the Naring Subkov uh, one uh, uh, tax form. So uh, that was from Tatiana. I think we, yeah. So that means we've answered forty-nine questions. Exactly. And, and only three minutes. Uh, I know most of the answers anyway. So 
<laughs> just kidding. Um, so well, then, then it's time to wrap it up. Huh? Let me just quickly yeah. say that we will, we will uh, post this PDF or, uh, or send it to you. That it depends on what Oslo wants to do. And uh, let me just thank you for paying attention to this uh, dry uh, information. And, and do not be afraid of, of contacting Oslo and they will contact me or contact directly um, to, to answer any questions you might have. And, and good luck with your artwork. I'm looking forward to seeing some of that art that... Uh, some point, so uh, I'm sure that Oslo and Visp will uh, display and show me all types of works as long as they uh, co come out. So yeah, thank you very much. And, um, well, thank you. Trip. I just want to um, end by saying that um, this webinar is, you can view it on uh, YouTube, but uh, as Christopher said, um, things may change suddenly when it comes to rules and regulations um, on taxes. So, you know, be yeah. aware that this was recorded on December 8th, 2020. Yeah. Also, um, if if it's if it's really incredibly difficult or everything to do with finances and business and taxes, you may have to consider just getting an accountant and to do your taxes um, because instead of spending two weeks trying to do it, you sh you could produce art, you could um, you could sell art, you could uh, apply for funding, you know, in those two weeks, and then. Have an accountant firm do it for you. Um, as a member of VISP, you can actually get a discount on uh, on accounting. You can see that under uh, discounts or rabatta. It's under the membership page on VISP if you're signed in. So, um, anything else to say, Christopher? No, and it, uh, like you said, it doesn't have to be expensive, and you might also just apply for just one one hour of, of uh, you know specific guiding on your concrete subjects if you want to do that i'm sure we'd, we'd find i'd love to to work with uh, with visp uh, in 2021 and, and going forward so yeah i i take great personal interest in in art and uh, uh yeah i'd love to love to, to be of assistance uh, if i can and when i can so uh, yeah next time maybe we do yeah. different rooms in your house with different artworks in the background yeah <laughs> thank you so All right. much. thank you for everyone watching today See you. Cheers. Bye.